Rob Venn here, and today we're going to be looking at the ideology of Captain Fantastic. Now, what have we got to look at? How does this relate to component one varieties of film and filmmaking? Well, you've got to look at how you responded to this film and what ideologies have been encoded into it by the filmmaker. So, what are the filmmaker's preferred readings? Okay, what are the dominant readings they're trying to put in it? Normally you'd say hegemonic readings from the Stuart Hall point of view, but if anything, this film is counter-hegemonic. Now, first thing you've got to ask yourself is, how does the film represent America, especially politically? Then you've got to consider, how does the film represent the American family? And what does the film suggest about this American dream? So what we're doing is we're thinking about what are the stereotypes of America politically? What is it, does it mean to be American? What is the American identity? What is their sense of self? How does that relate to politics and family and Protestant work ethic and all this kind of stuff? But then you've got to consider, how did you respond to the film? Now, in a way, you are not its primary target audience. You are not Americans. This is an American film for an American audience. But you've got to ask yourself, what parts of this film provided you with an emotional response? How did you respond to this film emotionally? Did you like it? Did you not like it? If so, why did you like it? If not, why didn't you like it? How did it make you feel? Did it laugh? Did it make you cry? Did it make you scared? Did it make you disgusted? Did it make you happy? What? Second thing, characters. Who's your favourite character? Why did you relate to them? Why are they your favourite characters? Are there any characters you don't like? Explain why you like them, why you don't like them. Who do you identify with? Who are you meant to identify with? Do you personally feel you identify with somebody who isn't one of the main characters? And then, what are the favourite parts of the film for you? Why did you like them? Why did it speak to you? Are there any parts of the film you didn't like? Explain. Okay, so that's what you need to be talking about. But what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you some ideological and political background to this film. Well, the first thing you want to understand is the politics of it. Right, now, this is the political compass, okay? We have a, a, like a, an x-axis and a y-axis. Now, the x-axis represents the traditional left-right divide. Left, center, right. Now, here you've got the far right, here we've got the far left, but that's economical to do with the economics, I should say, right? This is neoliberal capitalism. This is communism, right? This is to do with how much control a government has with, over you and how much freedom you have. In an authoritarian government, the government has complete control over the people. People live in fear of their governments. Down this end, there is no government. You've got total anarchy. Now, we don't mean anarchy as in chaos. We mean anarchy in a political sense in that well, it could be complete chaos, but it's um, anarchy in terms of the government has no control over individuals and the individual is completely um, in charge of their own life. Okay? You live your life however you want, providing it isn't impacting on others, you could say, in a left-wing point of view, I guess. But what these people are doing, so don't, no, this end of done this corner down here is basically do what you want, yeah. This end up is the government tells you what to do, all right. Now, what does this mean? In communism, there is no personal ownership of goods, okay. Everything is state owned on behalf of the people. We're looking here at the works of Karl Marx, Marxism, right? Karl Marx and Joseph Engels in the Communist Manifesto. What they basically talked about was the struggle between the workers, 
whom they termed the proletariat, and the owners, the people who owned the factories, who owned the farms, what they called the means of production. These were the middle classes. These were people who were called the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie are the... They don't produce anything. They just own capital. They own stuff that has value. Right? The only capital that the proletariat have is their skill and their time. And that's what they have to trade. All right? So what communism looked at was the idea that the people have to work and they slave and they work hard but the profit the the sort of like the uh, result of their hard work is exploited in favor of the bourgeoisie the bourgeoisie make all the money they get rich but it's the proletariat are doing all the work so what communism said is it needs to be more fair so you get rid of the bourgeoisie and the workers work for themselves the key tenet of communism is, or oh, for Marxism at least, is um, from each according to their ability and to each according to their need. So in other words, you work and you share the profit of your work. Sounds nice in principle, doesn't it? Never really worked, though. So this is what we mean by communism, Okay. The far opposite of that, the far right wing, is neoliberal capitalism. Capitalism is all about making profit. The idea is you work hard, in inverted commas, you have a good idea, you um, whatever, but you make as much money for yourself as you possibly can. It's about collecting as much consumer goods and as much wealth as you possibly can and in what it means by neoliberal is liberal means you know you can do what you like so the idea of neoliberal capitalism is this idea that the government should have no control over business no environmental controls no laws controlling what businesses can do businesses can do whatever they like and the check to their being completely you know off the scale bad is that the people wouldn't put up with it the people won't buy their goods for example if they don't think that they are moral which is why all these massive companies now have like you know anti-slavery policies and you know um, equal rights policies and fair trade policies even though they may not necessarily be legally required a lot of companies will have them because it makes them look good to the public right but anyway, neoliberal capitalism is about do what you want to make money, to make yourself wealthy, and the government has no control over you. The centre should be a bit of a balance. All right? As I said, this scale is all about how contr controlling the government is. Up here we've got dictatorships, totalitarian dictatorships, like Nazi Germany, um, like um, Pinochet's Chile, like Stalin's Soviet Union, people live in fear of their government because they can send you to a gulag to die or lock you up in a concentration camp to be gassed, right? They are really terrible places to live. These ones, on the other hand, could be equally terrible if you've got a government with absolutely no, like a country that has absolutely no government that's completely collapsed in utter chaos, you might think, somewhere like... Oh, I don't know, like um, Somalia, for example, I guess. Yeah. But this is about how much control they have over your own life. So down here, we're looking at, well, whose business is what you get up to as long as you're not hurting anybody else? Yeah. So things like this end, this is what the Americans would call liberals. Yeah. The kinds of people who, um, you know, are in favor of... You know, you're kind of social justice warriors, as the internet would call them, as if that's a bad thing, right? The idea that, you know, hey, you want to be gay? Who cares? You want to get a gay marriage? Fine, go for it, yeah? Does, you know, anti-racism, anti-sexism, anti-homophobia, um, pro the dissolution of gender binaries, you know, those kind of people. Down 
this end, yeah, these people up here, especially, these are much more likely to be very, what we call conservative, yeah? So they're like old-fashioned values. You know, they don't like change. They don't like progress. These are progressive, yeah? These people are conservative. They like things the way they were. You know, they may be very religious, yeah? That's the difference, okay? So when we usually talk about left wing and right wing, we usually mean the difference between this and this, all right? Whereas actually, technically, it means the economy, right? As you can see, this is American because it's an American film mainly, but, you know, Trump, according to the um, the... Uh, political compass is here. Frankly, I'd say he's more likely up here somewhere, if I'm honest. Not my opinion. Um, don't necessarily agree with that. I think that's a bit too centre-left for Obama. I'd put him more up here somewhere. I'd probably put Bush up there with Reagan and Trump up here, but what am I? I'm not a political expert. So, um, I would say our government at the moment is probably up around here very right wing so this is where Boris Johnson's conservative party pro Brexit stuff would be right if not further over here actually and that's what Owen Gleiberman said about this film in Variety the trade magazine for the media he says we're living at a moment after all when Donald Trump is on the right Bernie Sanders is on the left and Hillary Clinton is at the center well by American standards not by ours but the supporters of Trump and Sanders have more in common in many ways than either faction has with the supporters of Clinton. The left and the right in America are now selling different versions of the anti-establishment fervor and Captain Fantastic doesn't just reflect those two poles, it fuses them. It taps the topsy-turvy sympathies that now rule the political cultural zeitgeist. Ben and Jack both represent different ideological viewpoints, but in some ways both dislike the perception that, as Ben says, the powerful control the lives of the powerless. So whilst, you know, Ben is sort of like down, I don't know which one's which, gosh, I've forgotten. Um, whilst uh, Viggo Mortensen's character is very much down here, you know, they celebrate Noam Chomsky Day, don't they? This means they're down in this sector down here, the family, and that would put them under the banner of probably anarcho-syndicalists. You can Google that. Um, whereas, you know, the father-in-law, he's more up here somewhere. Traditional, conservative, religious, right? Now, this film is basically a critique of American society. Oh, by the way, before we go on to that, zeitgeist, good word. Spirit is geist. That means spirit of the age in German. So it means he's capturing the spirit of the time, the mood of the time, right? So this is a critique of a contemporary American society. One of the film's taglines is Americas are over uh, over-medicated and undereducated. And when the children enter mainstream society, they comment on the obesity of those around them. Everyone's so fat. Are they sick? Well, the answer to that is yes, yes, they are. Right, American food in particular is full of like um, corn syrup and high fructose corn syrup and bovine growth hormone and all sorts of things that are illegal in the EU and may very well be flooding our country post Brexit. Um, you know, chlorinated chicken and all this kind of stuff. And everyone, you know, in the old days, only you know, you know, if you went back to the pre-industrial age. Being fat was considered attractive because only poor people, or rich people, could afford to be fat. Only poor people were suntanned and skinny and muscly because they worked hard in physical jobs and out in the sunshine in all sorts of weather, and they didn't eat very well. Whereas rich people could be pale and pasty and soft-skinned and fat. Of course, that's the opposite now. Poverty is associated with fatness because our food is so full of fat and sugar and all this kind of stuff that's harmful to salt and all this kind of stuff. 
Um, so yes, they are sick. The food is poisoning them. All right. Whereas you know the family in Captain Fantastic, you know, eat what they can kill and what they can grow. There's no waste. They're very environmental in that respect. There's also an anti-authoritarian message throughout, including the scene where the children pretend to be a Christian cult to disconcert the police officer. You know, they aren't Christians. If it, you know, they're actually atheists. They're more than atheists. Yeah, they are anti-theists. Um, they are anti-theocracy. They are anti. By theist, we mean religious. They are anti-religion. They're not just atheists. It's not that they just don't believe that there isn't a god. It's that they're anti-religion, right? And they are, by pretending to be Christians, they're not just mocking the police, they're mocking religion. And now it's, you know, damaging and harmful and makes people insane from this point of view of the film. There's a recurring quote in the film that, that is, power to the people, stick it to the man. These are very famous phrases from the 1970s. Um, always reminds me of a British sitcom called Citizen Smith. Which guy, the power of the people, was his catchphrase. Um, you know, the man, meaning the authorities, the parent culture, yeah, the mainstream of America, the bourgeoisie, the ruling classes. Um, this film, again, is anti-theist. Christians in particular are mocked. Bear in mind that America is a vastly more religious country than the Britain is, in fact, most of Europe, in fact. Um, in a 2018 survey, 83% um, of Americans is identified as Christians versus only 42% of Britons. And that shows a very large difference. Now, we're ignoring ethnic minorities and ethnic religions like Judaism and um, Islam and, you know, Hinduism and all that kind of stuff. Because, you know, Christianity is the dominant religion in both of these countries. <clears throat> but, um, you know, something like 80% of Americans go to church at least once a week. And in this country, it's something like 8%. So, um, whilst people might culturally identify as Christian, very few of them are actively religious in this country. Relatively speaking. You know, or they're sort of like, you know marriages and christenings and maybe Christmas and Easter Christians, right? So this is a big deal for an American film to be mocking Christianity. And America is a very right-wing country. Um, ironically, at the moment, it seems to be shifting more to the left than we are. But um, we are very different in that respect. To give you some context in the 2017 general election they haven't done this for the current general election they know of this is where the, our particular parties were this is where the labor party was under jeremy corbyn whereas this is where the conservative party is under theresa may at the time um wasn't it yeah was it still um oh, i can't remember anyway um as you can see, we're in the same kind of place as kind of Reagan, our Conservative parties. He was the President of America in 1980, but at the same time as Thatcher in this country. If anything, we're moved even further right than Thatcherism. Um, so there's a lot that the person who replaced Thatcher as the head of the Conservative Party, John Major, actually he was encouraging people to vote Labour in the last election because that's how far the right the Conservatives have swung recently. All right. Um, Liberal Democrats are more centre-right. Labour Party is centre-left. So, this is Noam Chomsky. Um, they celebrate Noam Chomsky Day in this film. Um, Matt Ross, the director of this film, himself, with his family actually celebrates Noam Chomsky Day. This is a thing he's taken from his real life and put in the movie, okay? Noam Chomsky is a linguist. He studies language, but he's more than that. He's a philosopher. He's a cognitive scientist, a historian, a political activist. He is known for being exceptionally left-wing. Um, he's called the father of modern linguistics. He's a major figure in the analytic philosophy 
and is one of the founders of the field of cognitive science. He holds a joint appointment as the Institute Professor Emer Emeritus at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and MIT, that is, and a laureate professorship at the University of Arizona. He's the author of over 100 books on topics such as linguistics, war, politics and mass media and ideologically aligns with the anarcho-syndicalism and libertarian socialism areas of politics. He is a very famous, uh, very famous philosopher, frankly, probably the most famous philosopher in the world, arguably alive today anyway. Um, very, very, well, practically a household name, to be honest. Um, he is often seen um, being interviewed on a variety of different topics. Um, very interesting man, good writer. Now, these are our characters. Ben, played by Viggo Mortensen. Nye, played by Charlie Shotwell. Kyla, by Samantha Isla. Raelian, by Nicholas Hamilton. Vesper, by Annalise Basso. Bodovan, by George McKay. And Z Zaya, Zaja, I don't know. Shree Cooks, anyway. Um, obviously, you need to know these names, okay? So make sure you've written them down because you need to be mentioning them, all right? Right, I will come back to the key sequences later, okay? Um, but these are the key sequences you really want to be looking at. The very first one is the opening sequence. Um, then there's a sequence in the bus. That's quite a good one, too. And then there's the final sequences. But one of the things we can be talking about with some of this film's key visual imagery is that much of it, especially at the beginning, is very bucolic. That means it's beautiful and it relates to the beauty of nature and the country. I mean, the film starts with this helicopter tracking shot, an aerial shot over the forests of, um, I'm assuming it's northwest America, somewhere up in, like, Washington or something like that, Washington State, I don't know. But anyway, look at how beautiful everything is. Long shots to show the beauty of nature. There's a lot of that. Um, there's a lot of sort of like just um, what they call aspect editing, where it's just to show how, set a sense of mood and a sense of place. The film's got stunning cinematography. Look at the way this uses lens flare, which would have once been considered a major mistake and something to avoid, but now is associated with beauty and sunlight. Everything's got this soft, warm, naturey feel. The other thing we get is lots of close-ups. Um, for example, look at the way this is framed. Look at how Viggo Mortensen here is seen in reflections, in mirrors. In fact, a lot of people have seen in this film in reflections and mirrors. Look at how the frame of the rearview mirror and the slash of the seatbelt constrain him. They are like, you know, it's claustrophobic. He's being pushed into a corner. He's being boxed in. And this high angle shot looking down at him makes him look small and weak and vulnerable, especially with the look in his face. Yeah? So, you know, consider the difference. Again, this is another sequence on the same one. Everything's, there's lots of really, really, really long, extreme long shots, but also very, very, very tight, big close ups and extreme close ups. There's a lot of that binary opposite the open and the constrained, the personal and intimate versus the vastness of nature you know you know that's makes you know, wilderness as far as you can see it makes you feel insignificant and unimportant whereas this of course shows that you are significant you are important um again another thing quickly to mention here costume and mise-en-scene um this is again and almost an attack on the cultural mores of American conservatism. Here they are in this church where everyone is expected to put on their Sunday best. Grey, conservative-looking suits. They've got short, tight hair. The women are in dresses. They've got their hair up. And yet these people are being... The family are being shown very much as free spirits. They're very much coming from the hippie culture of the 1960s and 1970s. Um, especially the girls looking very 1970s with loyal flowers in their hair literally and bright colors and woolen dresses that they probably knitted themselves um you know look at bodovan and his 
multicolored patched top, his waistcoat. Maybe a little bit of a reference to Joseph and his multicolored coat, you know. I don't know, whatever. But anyway, it's sort of like, you know, this is his personal expression. The kids are allowed to watch what they want. Um, you know, look, sh a shark onesie, you know, because that's how he feels comfortable in. This outfit with this Russian gas mask and the boiler suit looks very, very much like um, the costume worn by Paddy Considine in um, Dead Man's Shoes, in which he plays a vigilante psychopath murderer <clears throat> quite creepy but you know they're allowed to express themselves and this bright red suit is probably something he owned before he just beat off into the wilderness it probably seemed perfectly reasonable when he bought it but you know that's the kind of suit you wear to a nightclub not a church so their costumes tell us some, an awful lot about them notice how they're walking in a you know a flank they're all side by side they're, they're marching in um, they're taking over this place. This, this shows that they're proud. It shows that they're strong. It shows that they're together. They're a family unit. Look at the way they're holding hands. Having said that, if I've got a criticism with this film, is the way it does sideline the female characters. The girls, unfortunately, have not an awful lot to do. This is very much a film. It's a boys' film about boys. It's about father-son relationships, principally. It's a triangle between these three, really. Yeah, the girls don't get much of a look in, unfortunately. It's the one downside, I think, of this film. Um, what else have we got on here? Okay, now, this is a sequence where um, Ben goes to and talks to Jack in his office. Now, you can see that Viggo Mortensen's wearing a Jesse Jackson 88 T-shirt. Um, Jesse Jackson was a Democratic candidate in 1984 and 1988, running against um, Ronald Reagan. He was very much, he was a black candidate for president. He was, um, if I'm not mistaken, a protege of Martin Luther King, but I could be wrong on that one. But he was very progressive, very left wing, and obviously a black candidate. Now, this tells us a lot about Ben's politics, but it also tells us a lot about Viggo Mortensen, because Viggo, that is Viggo Mortensen's own T-shirt that he got when he was campaigning for Jesse Jackson back in 88. All right? So that tells us an awful lot about the political opinions, not just of the characters, but of Viggo Mortensen himself, which is, in, this is the significance of why he's starring in this film, why he's perfect for the role, because... You know, he has got some political sympathies with the character. Look at the binary opposites here. We've got Ben. He's liberal. He's very, very socialist. Anarcho-syndicalist, technically, I guess. Anti-authoritarian and atheist. All right, we can see this from his shirt, okay? His long hair, his beard. He's quite hippie-ish looking. In fact, his T-shirt's untucked. He does have a lock knife on his belt, which would get you arrested in this country, but in America is considered a perfectly normal to be walking around with a knife. I mean, hey, America is perfectly normal to walk around with a gun. But, you know, this is a symbol of his, his independence, the fact that it's, you know, it's not a weapon, it's a tool. It's something he uses to go and live in the wilderness. Right? Contrast this with the arrows. Right, these are Jack's arrows. Jack uses arrows to hunt for fun. Right, he's a sport hunter. Ben and his family only hunt for food. Let me say they don't enjoy it, but that's what they hunt for. Look at Jack, Ben's father-in-law. Now he epitomizes what is conservative. Right. He is an ex-Navy pilot. So he's a veteran. He served in the military. He's very conservative. He's also wealthy. Look at the size of his house. It must have cost a fortune. He's conservative. He's Republican, which is you know the American equivalent of our conservative party. So he's conservative with a little C. Well, not a big C if you put it that way. 
I mean, look at the mise en scene. We can see his Navy officer's cap. We can see him there in uniform with an American flag. We've got a model of a P-3 Orion maritime patrol aircraft up here. Can't quite see what that one is. But as so obviously a military aircraft, we can see his medals and stuff here. It shows that he is conservative, that he is, you know, ex-military, etc., etc. It tells us a lot about his character. You know, he's dressed in a casual, but sort of like smart, casual kind of conservative manner. You know, quite bland in a way. He's also older. All these kind of things. It makes a contrast. He's clean shaven. He's got short hair. All these kind of things. The contrast between the two of them, the binary opposites. All right. Um, we can look at him as being quite masculine. This sort of like, you know, man cave kind of thing he's got going on here is den or whatever it is is quite masculine it's dark rich colors it's wood it's you know leather and stuff like that it's iron it's you know it's a masculine kind of environment whereas i guess you could argue that beard notwithstanding you know ben's long hair might be feminizing me a little bit at least there are a number of sequences in this um both of these two sequences, where father and son shave. Now, this is metaphorical, and in fact, he cuts his hair shorter. He still keeps it quite long and shaggy, though. The beard is a symbol of masculinity, for a start, but a particular kind of masculinity. You could say it's an uncivilized kind of masculinity. It represents, you know, they'd be living out in the wilderness where shaving is a waste of time. You know, why shave your beard off, right? It needs water, it needs soap, it needs a razor that you're going to keep sharp, right? These kind of things are luxuries. A beard is going to keep you warm, things like that, right? It represents his masculinity, but it represents his wildness, his untamed nature. As does his long hair, in a way, which sort of feminizes him a little bit as well. So when Ben shaves off his beard and cuts his hair a bit shorter, it represents a compromise. He is jettisoning, in, or not necessarily rejecting, but sort of like um, putting to the past... The wild living out off the grid in the in nature side of his personality and civilizing himself a bit but not too much he's cut his hair a bit but not a much he still kept it a little bit long because it still represents that little bit of anti-authoritarian rebellion right when Raelian does it his hair is very long and very it very much feminizes him he's got a very kind of androgynous kind of look these sort of like you know, part male, part female. Especially in this kind of paisley shirt he's got. And when he cuts it here, he cuts it into a very 1950s, conservative, almost militaristic buzz cut. This is him totally surrendering to ordinary life as he's going off to university. He wants to integrate into, you know, you know he's, he's rejecting that feminine side of him. He's rejecting that natural nature living out in the woods side of himself and you know civilizing himself essentially by cutting his hair yeah we also might consider the biblical story of samson with the power in his long hair and when he cut it and all that kind of stuff you know this loaded with meaning right hair is very much part of a person's identity right again the cinematography um, look at this, this long shot here. Um, look at this pool of light. This is Charoscuro, right? Pools of light and dark. Okay. Um, notice the binary opposite, the way the basketball pole splits the two. Yeah. Raelian is much more... No, Bodovan, sorry. It is Bodovan or Raelian, isn't it? Yeah. Bodovan is much more like his father. Raelian rejects that. He blames Ben for his mother's death. He sides much more with his grandfather. He wants to rebel against the authoritarian father figure. 
I mean, let's face it, if you've got a conservative father, and that, whether it be literal, whether you're rejecting your actual father or whether you're rejecting the patriarchal mainstream parent culture, if that is conservative, you rebel by becoming liberal and left-wing, right? But if the parent culture is liberal and left-wing, you rebel against that by becoming coming conservative and that's kind of what Raylian is sort of doing whereas Ben he wants to live in the world but he's still his father's son right um, this is an interesting shot as well from when they're in the supermarket um, what's interesting here is look it says fresh farm but is it really? I mean, these are people who live off the land, who only eat what they can hunt and what they can grow. This food is artificial. I mean, it's like real food, yeah, but it's grown in artificial conditions. They are only picked if they are aesthetically meeting a certain level of aesthetics. You know, we've got this kind of wonky veg kind of movement going on nowadays, haven't we, where, you know... You know, your apples that aren't perfectly apple shaped or your bananas that aren't, you know, curved in just the right way are being sold at cheaper prices to make it look more environmental. Where in the old days they've been rejected because they want stuff that looks good for the consumer. All this colour and stuff, it's it's fake off, you know, authenticity. Yeah. It's trying to be authentic, it's trying to be saying, look, fresh fruit, healthy, great. But it's too perfect it's too artificial it's too fake yeah when they essentially rob this shop they don't feel that it's immoral in their sense it's not immoral because they are fighting against the system they are reappropriating things it's you know the, they're fighting against the bourgeoisie the owners the two percent the rich yeah they are taking back what should be belonging to the people Right, they see it's perfectly moral. Um, the director of this film, Matt Ross, has cited the works of Simon Johan, a photographer, very much as being an influence on this film's aesthetic. Um, he does a lot of nature photography. Great picture of these monkeys. It's a beautiful picture of the composition, the colour. The, the way the monkeys are all looking at us. The, just the weird-ass looking monkeys, quite frankly. They're a bit odd looking. I've never seen them before. But, you know, I've got a gorgeous photograph, right? Anyway, this idea of nature is very much in this guy's photography. Look at this kid here. Um, very much the long-haired, almost androgynous child. Yeah, we don't know if it's male or female. It could be either. This, you know, is an influence on the look of the kids in this film. This is Matt Ross. You might recognise him as Gavin Belson of Silicon Valley, one of the best American sitcoms of recent years. Um, ironically, a hyper-capitalist computer um, company owner, sort of like the, um, the character he plays in that show, sort of like a cross between... Um, Steve Jobs and um, someone like uh, Jeff Bozos or um, something like that. But anyway, um, he actually grew up in an off-the-grid alternative hippie-ish commune in the Pacific Northwest. So he's very much drawing on the influence of his own early years and youth in this not as extreme we weren't actually living in the wild as such they were living in a commune off the grid though um he had very hippie parents um before he went off to become a filmmaker and actor as i said he actually with his family celebrates noam chomsky day rather than christmas um some little bits of interesting stuff going on the film here <coughs> that you might not normally notice unless you're really paying attention foreshadowing a Chekhov's gun. In the campfire scene when they're all reading earlier on the film, um, you can see the railing is reading the Brothers Karazimov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Because, you know, Fondasiakla, Russian 
literature is, you know, every little boy's reading material. But it's a novel about three brothers who, with increasing age, start to shun and rebel against the ways of their father, just like Raelian and, to a lesser extent, Bodovan do later on in the movie themselves. So this is telling us something. It's foreshadowing his rebellion later on. Um, later on in the film, obviously, you've also got a sequence where um, one of the daughters, I can't remember which one, is reading Lolita. Uh, for those of you who don't know the book Lolita, it's um, a story about a paedophile who falls in love with a 12-year-old girl, marries her mother, and when the mother commits suicide, when she finally realises that he's actually in love with the daughter, not her, they go on the road and travel around with the, as a, you know, together. Um, very, very disturbing book that's not necessarily very good reading material for a girl that age, but it's considered to be a great classic of literature. Didn't like it myself. We got about halfway through it and gave up. But, you know, very challenging material. He, they, he doesn't treat the children like idiots. He treats them like grown-ups, which is why they are so intelligent. We can say that one of the things that is characteristic of modern culture is the way it infantilizes people. It treats us like infants. So, and not just literal children, but adults are infantilized as well. We have an obsession with youth and youth culture rather than maturity and age. We value looking young and dressing young. I mean, go and have a look at what a photographs of what people look like in World War Two. I mean, you go and you know you read about someone like Guy Gibson, you know the World War Two fighter race who had you know no legs and went on to become a great fighter pilot, right? You look at pictures of these people and they look about forty, but they were like twenty one. Whereas nowadays you look at people who are forty and they look twenty one. Right, because they dress younger than they actually are, and they, you know, have plastic surgery and Botox and whatever to look younger, and they, you know, all this kind of stuff, right? So we're obsessed with youth and youth culture, and infantilizing everything. You know, this is something that's only really happened since I want to say the nineteen sixties, I guess. Um, the teenager as we know it was invented in the 1950s and by the 1960s the teenager became the you know the ideal of what society would be i mean think you know it's an old thing but think about romance movies romance movies are all about young love they're all about the first love but they're about teenagers they're about you know all this kind of stuff how often do you see romance or love movies about People in the 50s and 60s, for example, or people who've been in a marriage for 30 years. Happens, but it's rare because we're obsessed with youth. So, in class, I will show you some clips and I will go over them in detail, right? Um, first of all, we're going to look at the opening sequence. I want you to consider how does the opening sequence introduce ideologies important to the film as a whole? How do identifications with characters begin to form in the opening sequence? And how and why does the opening sequence trigger different emotional responses? Consider all your micro features, your mise en scène, so your shot types, camera angles, compositions, your lens types, um, the mise en scène, so locations, props, costumes, um, color, light, blocking, performing styles you know, um, special effects, uh, all this kind of stuff. And then also consider your editing. Is it continuity editing? Is it non-continuity editing? Think about the sound. Is it diegetic, non-diegetic? Is it synchronous? Is it asynchronous? And consider the music. This film has got an incredible soundtrack by Alex Summers and Sir Garros. Beautiful soundtrack. It got on vinyl. I listen to it all the time. It's a fabulous album. How important is the music for manipulating your responses? Or how does it 
manipulate your emotions. Okay? Um, think about the ideologies. As I say, how does it introduce ideology to the film? How does it come with the character identifications? How does it trigger emotional responses? Why are they all the same? I don't know. Yeah, loads of stuff. You know, things. So, you've got establishing shot. Aerial shot, like I said earlier. What does it tell us about the place? The glory is very bucolic. Beautiful sunshine shining through the trees. It looks lovely. And then the deer. Oh, look, it's a deer. Isn't that lovely? Yeah, things aren't going to go well for this. Right, we think nature, we think beauty. But then we see the savagery of nature. Nature red in tooth and claw, as Kipling said, yeah? As, you know, Bodovan literally kills this deer with a bowie knife. Right, it's violent, it's shocking, it's upsetting. Right? completely changes the mood of the film. How does that affect our understanding of the characters, how we feel about them? You know, these aren't people who are hunting for the fun of it. The people are hunting because if they don't, they eat, don't eat. How does it relate to the savagery of humanity? You know, think, remember, we talked about with um, Vertigo, we talked about the um, Jungian, Carl Jung's idea of the shadow, Everyone's got a light and a dark side. Well, this is the light and the dark side, isn't it? It's the beauty and the savagery. It's life and it's death. Um, look at the way Bodovan's all camoed up here. You know, he's got his face covered in mud to camouflage himself and his hair. He looks savage. You know, he looks, at this point, this film could be set any time in the last couple of hundred years. Yeah? He looks like you know, a primitive human, like a caveman or something, doesn't he, right? Look at this, this idea of him being anointed with the blood of his first kill. This is common in hunting cultures. They do it in this country with fox hunting when the, you know, when you go fox hunting with a child and the, they kill the first fox, they take the blood of the fox and they wipe it on the face of the child. They do it in America, I've seen you know, other ones where they actually have to drink a cup of blood, things like that. It's a, you're taking the blood of the kill into yourself. Yeah, it's showing that he's a man. It's sort of like one of those um, sort of like manhood rituals we don't really get in most modern Western cultures. You know, unless they're like Jewish or things like, you know, the Jews are things like bar mitzvahs, for example, and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, those are the kind of things we wanted to talk about. Okay, think about those, and I'm going to go over it in class in detail. If you've got any questions, you know where I am. Talk to you next time.